Welcome back, everyone, to one more episode of One Million Minds. How are you doing, Balaji? Hey, Raji. You're a great man. I just I think you're catching the tail end of the summer school holiday season and getting ready back to school. <laughs> yes, back to school is definitely a, a busy time of the year for us. So, but it's been a great summer, though. So I'm excited for, you know, for the regular life to start back so the kids can actually do something useful so that's always good but i know gotcha. we have a, a lot of content to cover today so let's jump into it i want us to start with the the big llama 3.1 release i want to get your thoughts on it because from my take this is one of the premier um models that's available for free i'll start at that level and uh, based on everybody has their own benchmarks we've talked about this we've talked about how the intelligence layer the lm layer has become commoditized and it's going to uh, i wouldn't say zero but uh, cheaper so the closed source models always have this uh, uphill battle to fight so keeping that context the 3.1 released with the 405 billion which is the biggest model and the distal model that 8 and 70 billion there's so much to unpack here, and there was a great letter from um, Mark Zuckerberg about this. But let's talk about what this uh, model does, and just some comparisons. And then I wanted to spend some time talking about the letter. Just a general, um, I align with a lot of uh, his vision, so I just wanted to, us to talk through it. But let's start with your thoughts on the model, some of the benchmarks, any key takeaways you have from this. Absolutely, Rajni. I think um, Lama is making tremendous progress in this space, primarily because they open source some of it, so it's all we can see the benefits. Um, secondly, I think the benchmark numbers are, um, again, getting better and better. We had another episode where we talked about how these tests and what they compare um, and stuff like that. But in this case, uh, one thing you can notice is that they advertise instruction tuned, right? Um, what does that even mean, right? I think we have large language models which can do um, things based on what you fine tune it for, either it's a Q&A, uh, mm -hmm. large language model, or it's just generating text, uh, or it's a vision. Or So instruction tune is primarily you are instructing it to do something, like you're specifically saying, hey, you're taking up this role, do this type of thing. So it's basically trained to follow instructions. Um, and I think more and more we can see people are getting productivity out of that particular area. Probably that's why the focus is on instruction tuning, right? So you tell it to do something and it does the thing, hopefully without hallucinations, but we'll come to that, right? But I think it's getting better where you're trying to tell it to do something and it does it the way it was told. Um, and, and I think they produced some benchmark results for the eight, um, 70 and 400 uh, billion parameter models, I believe. Let's see. Yeah. Um, and let's go to that. Performance metrics and the benchmarks. Yeah, um, so I think yeah you can you can see how um, what type of improvement it's gradual but it's continuing to move upwards. Um, and in comparison to other models, I think this is uh, showing uh, definitely a lot of uh, promise. Uh, and being available as an open source, a lot of people can play with it and actually verify these things too, right? I think some of these measures are based on a test metrics, and then when it goes to the live environment, does it do the same? Right, so you need. There's two parts to this benchmarking, right? One you do it under lab, and the other you do it in the real world. Right. So. Yeah, it's interesting because even from uh, three to three point one from April, will be four months away now, uh, and it's shown improvement, right? So to your point, this is uh, continuously improving, and it's open source, which means people can take it, make it their own, and fine tune it to their business needs, and not have to worry about you know being uh, dependent on a closed source model so i want to overlay some of the things that uh, mark said in his letter is one of the key things is like they're spending tons of money on getting these models ready why is it he giving it away right like is it just because he's altruistic and everything needs to he's trying to be um you know help the world but a couple of things he said like he compared it to when linux uh, was going to the open source thing right there's a lot there's a lot of closed source model but because linux was made open source 
that's when the adoption got bigger and more stronger things uh, were built on it. Even uh, the cloud computing, mobile computing, if you look at it, most of the background is still Linux. So he he envisions AI going the same way. Yes, there's, they are closed source system. They were popular in the beginning, but then it took an open source system where more people could contribute it to make it secure and level the playing field for everybody. So, um, so that that's what's going. So, what he did, with what he's showing right now, is how one of the key takeaways is how did Linux even become the standard? Is because of the adoption. Lots of players, lots of big players adopted. A lot of developers adopted it, and that helped it become the standard. So, one thing that they've done really smart about this is not only did they just released it and say, hey, "You guys go figure out how to do it." They have a bunch of partners already who are production ready for them to start using these models in their own version, right? For AWS office in the cloud, Rock has their own chipset that now you can use a Llama on top of and has a lot of speed, um, the best speed, I think, based on some of the things I've read. So they did two prong. One is let's make it open source so we can get it better. Second is let's release it with partners to make sure that people can immediately start using it. So what are your thoughts on that? Because this, I think it's brilliant what they're doing. 100%. I think um, making it open source and the, and the actual model architecture well known and uh, for everybody to adopt and engineer it their way and use it is a, is a key move, right? I think a lot of uh, people in the past are leveraged, like you said, Linux and, and even, I would say even Microsoft, to some extent, when they started out, a lot of things you can do on a Microsoft were not possible in other types of operating systems, right? So, the, so it gained popularity that way. Um, and I think similar thing with Android, right? So the, the versus Apple, right? There's, yes, there is this problem of marketplace and other things, but there are things that you, you can do in Android that you can't do in the, so there's pros and cons to, I think as the industry matures, I think you will get to that point. But for now, I think the more people uh, get to experiment with it, I think the more the, the popularity and more, uh, innovative it becomes. Um, so I definitely second that uh, thought in the sense of, hey, let everybody else participate in this uh, in this uh, space. Um, so I think one of the uh, things he also mentioned is how when the early days, they were kind of locked down by Apple ecosystem. They decided what features even were allowed to be released. They so. There's so many features they had to turn off on Facebook just because Apple said, no, you can't release those. So they don't want to go through the same kind of um, process with AI. They don't want to be dependent on a closed source system that could kind of restrict where they can take their vision, their model, right? So if, if, when I say they're just Facebook, so that's one of the things is, yes, we're spending a lot of money, we're making it free, but no, when I mean open source, sorry, and when you make it open source, it gets stronger, but now it's an open ecosystem. Anybody can use it. I think one of the examples I read is how, I might be saying the word wrong, but Kubernetes was a, a, just an inside Google kind of a tool, but Amazon was running away with the cloud and they wanted to compete. So they made that easily available to everybody. So you can actually go from one cloud to another one with a little bit more ease, because there was a kind of a lock-in um, mode that some of these cloud providers right. have this whatever right so those are so they there was a tool internally but they made it publicly available or open source it now that became the standard now amazon or whoever the front runner that lost the edge because people could switch now so there's no switching cost right. is lower so that that totally makes sense and one of the things i want to bring up when we talk about open source right so when we when we take this 8 billion 70 or 400 billion type of a model um it's open sourced with the training data that Meta used internally and probably the detailed res the responsible AI movement and other things that they are spearheading, probably they'll divulge as time goes by what it is, but it's not fully transparent, right? So so everything after the pre-training and a little bit of fine tuning that's disseminated is open source, right? So they still have that right. little piece where they're spending money on it. So, they, so uh, I would see that as a kind of a mode in the sense that larger the model is, you still have to go to them. There's no other way people can actually do anything, right? So it's kind of a, a situation where everybody's trying to see is small language model going to succeed or people are, I think there's a play for both, right? So you you, you have the world knowledge and the, and the specific um, domain knowledge. 
or for specific personal okay. knowledge, right? So, so this is a this is how it's evolving, and I, I think um, yes, the, when it comes to data, it's going to be very tough, right? And we can already see people will take compute to where the data is because now the data is it's difficult to move data from one place to another, right? right. That's what you you mean when 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 it comes to Kubernetes or other type of things that people are using, they're trying to take their compute workloads to where the data is. Uh, so they want to jump, right? But data is still the problem. If you, if you, your, your people will lock in, like if you have pentabytes of data with one provider, it's very hard to move it to another place. Agree. So I think, so there's a couple of things they've done well, which is um, to your point, and now you can take it, the distill the smaller models, or you take the big model and you fine tune with whatever your use cases. By your, you have your container with this. Uh, I mean, I say container just in a, uh, just to visualize it. You have your LLM and you have your chipset, whatever you want, and then your data just stays in there, which is one of the biggest concern about people sharing the data with some of these uh, closed source, where potentially your data could leave your. Um, privacy of you and go into their model and help with training. So I think it takes the, one of the biggest concerns a lot of companies have and kind of resolves it. But to your point, we still don't know all the weightage and everything that went into it, but it is definitely more uh, transparent than a closed source system, Correct. right? So Correct. that's a big, big thing. And then model protection. And then the second biggest thing is, again, at least according to Mark Zuckerberg, it's at least half the price of uh, GPT 4.0 and benchmark shows is, it's on par or better in some of these. So if you have an open source system, half the price to a closed source system where people are paying 2x the price, why would anybody pay for it? I shouldn't say why would anybody, over the long run, that, that is not a mo the sustainable, just because they're the first, um, uh, first leader advantage, right? I just feel like it's uh, it's definitely yeah, the time or the advantage is definitely being eroded every time a brand new open source model comes out. So uh, where you're showing is interesting because uh, I would love to see this along with the uh, chat GPT's um, cost or open AI's cost. And I think it'll be significantly higher. But even here, as you see, AWS are just looking at the biggest model is $16 and together the AI is $5, Databricks is 15, Fireworks. I'm just looking at the output. There's a wide range here. So I'm curious about why there's, uh, even though this is already cheaper, some of the providers are like one third of what a Amazon uh, is giving. So uh, there's so much to uh, kind of unpack here. So do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, Rajni, I think um, uh, we are seeing that this uh, Lama 3.1 is what, 2.5, times or up to three times cheaper, depending on who and where uh, it runs. Um, I think part of the, I think we have uh, discussed some of these aspects before, and I think it's all starting to show up in the pricing, right? Some of these providers, they have their own custom chips, right? Or they have engineered um, the pipeline, the inference pipeline a certain way where the data moves through the pipeline uh, in a very efficient manner, thereby um, they don't, have to spend nearly that money cycles to get the job done. Um, so that's where uh, like some of the key innovations taking place right now, right? Either you can, uh, I think Amazon has their own inference chip. Um, the, some of these other providers might have a version of uh, some chip they have probably to bring down the cost or, or they engineered a system where some of them probably are even um, getting some uh, consumer grade hardware. And, and that's one of the the great things with this open source, right? So you, with, even with the Google, right? Um, they started running Linux on, on all kind of hardware to stick it into a cloud distributed system, true. right? So when that comes to, so maybe not all of these people use the same high quality NVIDIA or the expensive price mark of the year, right? So maybe there is other type of hardware at play um, that's coming into uh, the picture where it's getting cheaper and it's being custom engineered by these vendors to. I think it's more, I would say, a lot of engineering work is going on under the hood to bring the cost efficiency, right? Um, and and that's that's good thing, right? When you have when you make something open source, now it's very clear what it's doing. People are taking it and altering it to, to retrofit their uh, pipelines, right? So uh, that could be one reason. Again, sure. I'm not quite sure exactly how Fireworks at AI is uh, three dollars and output on the higher four or five billion. Um, 
unless they use it as a last leader for now. I mean, that's also another strategy used. If you have a lot of funding, uh, you just uh, offer it at a cheaper price until you you make the volume, right? So, so I don't know. But these are common ways. Yeah. The, one, the other interesting uh, tidbit I heard is like, you know, how these are getting faster and faster, that like the inference is getting faster. A war point uh, will you and I will be able to perceive a difference between um, like a Lama 3.1 and a 4.1. Right? It could be faster, but if it gets any faster than you and I can read, then it doesn't matter. Right. That's on right. one side. If, if it's a computer to a human interface, if we can get, if it's fa as fast as I can read, or it gets a little bit faster than read, then I've reached, I've reached my limit because I can't really go read any faster. But on the flip side, for example, Grok and Llama is one of the best uh, speed as far as this whole setup goes. But we've talked about this. What if a model, and it's an agent and agent interaction, there's not the same constraint as you and me reading. There's gonna be multiple interaction between agents before it comes to the human for some kind of feedback or at least a response. So if you keep that as our architecture, then speed and cost lowering is going to be a big uh, difference in those models, right? So if, if agent agent can talk, they don't have their constraints. So the, the faster those conversations happen, the cheaper they are, the better um, application I can build. So I think if you're going to continue to see this push for faster and cheaper, just because it makes a lot of sense in some of the applications that we have not even seen, right? We very early in this whole process, um, the infrastructure is moving the same direction we thought. The cost is moving the direction, which means I think we haven't seen a killer um, application yet or all the things we could possibly even dream of right now. But all the things are headed to a point where which I think innovation is going to help us come up with some really good applications. That's right. I think uh, that's a fine point you made. Um, the, the latency and the inference speed and the performance of things, right? I think as we move closer to the edge where a human is sitting in front and consuming this, I think uh, you're right in the sense, like I think a lot of these edge systems are getting geared towards uh, you know, uh, lower tokens per second processing power, which is okay because mm -hmm. the human can't read us. Uh, if you just throw an entire page at them, they can't just consume it in a split second like a machine, right? So you're okay with 20 or 40 tokens per second and you're streaming it and they continuously are getting updated and they can read. Um, but on the backside, there's, there's going to be a huge need for faster uh, and, and more data or context window type of applications, right? Um, so it's a combination. I think it, it's interesting to see how this all evolves. And there's a place, it looks like already, there's a place for every variation. You have a 4K context window to 100 uh, million token context window, right? It's like whatever, it's just huge uh, space and, and people yeah. are trying to fit, yeah. fit their use cases in there. Um, it's very interesting. And this is only text, right? And we, we, we are not even talking about visual, multimodal, audio. There's so many other type of use cases. Um, the primary focus, uh, a lot of these are text generation. That is true. That is true. We are basically, um, like I said, we are very early in this and all, and this model is also multimodal support. So, and they're releasing new updates. It's, I can't wait for, in six months from now, what we'll be talking about will be 4.1 that just blows us away. So I, I, I'm excited about it. 